lose flesh I hear the sorrow of the world It seems like everybody's lost and scared Trying to make sense of it all And as I try Assalamu alaikum, peace be to you Welcome to the Dean Show Which is a way of life Where we're trying to educate you, the audience About Islam and Muslims directly from the source Today's topic will be Islam in the Bible where I am going to try to present to you the audience that what Islam says now is the same thing that has always been said throughout the Bible throughout all the prophets of God throughout God from the beginning of time until now and the question I put out to you the audience is no matter what your be, beliefs may be I want to ask you where do you stand in those beliefs do you stand at a position in your beliefs where you can firmly say that I know what I believe in I know its sources, I know they are authentic, and I can verify everything that I do within my own beliefs directly from the sources. This I ask you today, and I am going to show you and prove to you that I as a Muslim and Islam can verify its sources, not only from our books, from, but from the books of, that God has always revealed. So God willing, we're going to take a journey through the Bible, and I'm going to show you Islam is in the Bible, it is the same message that has been taught by all the prophets of God. I begin by a statement of Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, where he said a very concise statement. And this is life eternal, that they may know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ whom you have sent. And this is in John chapter 17 three. verse 3. This is what he was saying, and this is the way to eternal life. You would think that this would have been a very good chance, had he been the Son of God come to earth to die for our sins, this would have been a very good chance for him to say, the way to eternal life is for you to accept me as your savior, that I am going to die for your sins and that my blood is your means to salvation. But he did not say this. What he said was that they may know you, the only one true God, and Jesus Christ whom you have sent. And that word sent means sent as a messenger. So this was the statement of Jesus about how to attain eternal salvation. Now if we look at some of the descendants of Abraham, which is where all of the three major religions of the world can trace their lineage back to. Islam traces its lineage back to Abraham. It's, uh, Christianity can trace its lineage back to Abraham. Islam can trace its lineage back to Abraham. Coming from the sons of Abraham, Isaac and Ishmael. We know that Isaac, Moses descended from Isaac, and so came the, the children of Israel, the Jews, and through them came Jesus Christ. Now we know Abraham also had a son named Ishmael. And we're going to discuss Ishmael in a little more, a uh, little more in detail in just a few minutes, God willing. From Ishmael descended the Arabs, and from the Arabs directly came, uh, from a direct line from Ishmael came the last prophet of God, Muhammad, peace be upon him. Now, as we look today in the world, we look at the world population, the world population based on religion and based on creeds. Now we know that. Islam is the fastest growing religion in the world. It is growing at an annual rate of 235%. And it is said that by the year 2015, according to statistics, that Muslims who are now one-fourth of the world's population will become half or over half of the world's population. Islam will be the largest world religion. So I ask you, the audience, that a religion that is now the fastest growing religion in the world, where one fourth of one out of every four people in the world is Muslim, why is it that the majority and the masses of people do not know the truth about Islam? They do not know who are Muslims, and that which they do know is derogatory given to them by various media outlets and various sources that give derogatory information on Islam. Why is it not that people are searching to try to find out the truth of Islam for themselves based on the fact that this? way of life, this way of living, will be the dominant way of living within the next eight years, God willing. If you were to go to school, they would teach you about everything. They teach you about how people migrated from Africa through the, the, the continental shelf, through the Antarctic shelf, uh, how the Native Americans got here from Africa, all these small minute things they will teach you. But this way of life, which will be the most dominant way of life, God willing, in the near future, you know nothing about. You're taught nothing about in this society. And I want to know and question, people ask me why. Why don't we know about Islam and Muslims? Why are not more people speaking out on, about Islam and what really Islam says and what Muslims are really about? 
and I have the question that you should ask the same thing. You should ask, why are you not being given this information? Why do you not know about Islam? And why are the only things that are given to you about Islam are negative? This is a question you, yourself, the audience, must ask those people around you. Now, one of the biggest men's conceptions about Islam is that it is an Arabic religion. It is a religion founded by Arabs and practiced by Arabs, which this is no way even close to being the truth. According to the statistics, only 15 to 18 percent of the world Muslim population are Arabs. The other 82 percent are non-Arabs. So how could this be an Arab religion when the Arabs are the minority within the way of life, within what is called the religion, the religion of Islam, which is Islam is a way of life, not just a religion. But for the use of the common terminology, we'll use the word religion. The religion of Islam, non-Arabs make up the majority of the population. 20% African, 10% come from Russia and China, 17% come from Southeast Asia, 30% in the India subcontinent, 13% other places in the world like Europe, America, South America, places like this, 10% Turkey, Iran, Afghanistan. U.S. population is 84% of those people who confess that their religion is Christianity. 3.7% Muslims, which is about 10 million, which today is about 10, about 12, 10 to 12 million people in this country who are Muslims. A very big minority in this country, Muslim. 2.1% Jews, 10.2% who say that they are other. Also, a little known fact is that Islam is the second largest religion percentile in many countries. In the US, it's the second largest religion. The UK, it is the second largest religion with 4%. In Canada, it's the second largest religion. France, the second largest religion. Germany, the second largest religion. And it is continuing to grow by a percentile of 235%. I would not say that it's growing, but Islam is exploding around the world by God's leave. Now, as I said before, Islam is the world's fastest growing religion. Every fourth person in the world is Muslim. Now, if we take into account that also every fourth person in the world is Christian. So if every fourth person in the world is Christian and every fourth person in the world is Muslim, this means that half the world is either Christian or Muslim. P many people know about it, Christianity. Why does no one know about Islam? I'm here today, God willing, to try to give you some information about that. One third of the countries of the world, one third of the countries of the world, 58 out of 189, have over a 50% population of Muslims. One third of the countries of the world, 50% Muslim population. Today, there are over 10 million Muslims in the USA and there are over 4,000 mosques in the US and Canada alone. 4,000 mosques within the US and Canada alone and there are new mosques being built all the time. And in the year 2015, 2016, as I stated before, Muslims in the world will be a majority. God willing, we will become a majority into the world. So I'm asking you, why don't you find out about the religion of Islam now for yourself before this? Become a part of this growing and exploding way of life that is one of the most beautiful ways of life God has ever revealed for mankind on the face of this earth from the beginning of time to the end of time, which we will discuss in detail, God willing. Now, some of the common views that are held between Christianity, Judaism, and Islam, using text from the Bible. These texts from the Bible can also be correlated with texts from the Quran, as we will see God willing. Monotheism, which is something that is professed by Jews, Christians, Muslims. But we're going to get into it a little more in detail. In the Torah, or in the Old Testament, God says over and over again, uses these same wordings, but I'm going to use Isaiah, 44 verse 6 I am the first and I am the last and besides me there is no other God I am the first I am the beginning I am the end and besides me there is no other God I am the only God using the New Testament Mark chapter 12 verse 29 the Bible said the Lord our God is one Lord this is coming from the mouth of Jesus Christ himself the Lord our God is one. And in the Quran, we have the exact same phrase. He is God, the one and only. Which in Arabic is, Kul huwa Allah ahad. That say He is God, the one, the only. We are not saying anything different. 
We are saying the same things that have always been said from the Old Testament to the New Testament to the Quran. The message has not changed. Only people have changed the message. God's message as one. God does not change, therefore his message could not change. His religion could not change. His ways of life that he given, has given to humanity could not change. They must be the same. And as we see here, monotheism is an underlying fact that has been from the Old Testament to the New Testament to the Quran. We are not saying anything different. Prophets. Muslims believe and accept all the prophets mentioned in the Torah, the Bible, and the Quran. We accept them. We accept all of the prophets without taking or adding any of them. Also with the miraculous birth of Jesus. Besides Christianity, Islam is the only religion on earth that accepts the miraculous birth of Jesus. We are one of the only religions that, that verify and use in our books to verify that Jesus was born of a Virgin Mary. This is something even the Jews themselves, they deny. But we as Muslims attest to this and defend not only Jesus, but his mother Mary, peace be upon them, on this issue. Jesus is mentioned 25 times in the Quran. 25 times he is mentioned by name in the Quran. The highest honor of women in Islam. The highest woman in Islam, that title is given only to one woman and that is Mary, the mother of Jesus. And it is given to her in verse and chapter 19 of the Quran which is actually entitled after her. It is Surah Maryam or Surah Mary or chapter Mary of the Holy Quran. There is a whole chapter in the Quran devoted just to the mother of Jesus Christ Mary and she is given the highest status that can be given to a woman. She is known as the highest woman in the world in history. Was given to the status of Mary the mother of Jesus by Islam. Greetings. All the time you hear, you hear Muslims, they'll say to each other, when they greet each other, Assalamu Alaikum, which means peace be unto you, or peace be with you, or may you have peace. This is nothing new. This is not something we invented. This is not something that Muhammad, peace be upon him, invented. All the prophets had this same greeting, that they used, peace be with you. And I'm going to give you some evidences, God willing. Assalamu Alaikum is in many times when Jesus would greet the people, he would say to them, peace be unto you. There's many evidences over and over again in the New Testament. When Jesus would greet someone, he would greet them, peace be unto you. Peace be unto you. Peace be unto you. This was a statement that he always used. This was a statement that was used by all the prophets. It only meant, may I, you have peace. Now another topic, taking off of shoes, which is something a Muslim does not only in the mosque, he goes and he takes off his shoes because it is a sacred place, but even in his home. In his home where he prays, he takes off his shoes. Why does he take off his shoes? God ordered Moses to take off his shoes in Exodus 3 and 5. When he saw the burning bush, the first command God gave him was, Take off your shoes because you are standing on sacred ground. Put off shoes from your feet. Again, we see in Joshua 5 and 15. Muslims take off their shoes whenever they enter the mosque or ever whenever they enter into their homes. Whenever they enter into a place where they are going to worship God, they take off their shoes. Purification before prayer, which in Islam is known as wudu or ablution, which we make this ritual purification with water before we pray. Is this something new? Let's see. In Exodus 40, 30 and 31 and 32, Moses washed his feet. We see in Acts 21, verse 26, Saint Paul purified himself and then he went to the, to the temple. This is something that has been practiced by the Jews for centuries. Before they enter into the synagogues, they, they will wash themselves, purify themselves before they enter. So we have not invented anything new. We are just continuing the path in the example of the prophets. We are just continuing to follow the example of all the prophets. That we are doing the same thing. We have not invented anything new. Fasting. Muslims fast for 30 days during the month of Ramadan. For one month. We fast during the daylight hours in order to purify ourselves before God. Is this something new? Let's see. In Matthew 4 and 2 it is said that Jesus fasted for 40 days. He fasted for 40 days. This was something he was known to do, to fast. He said some things can only be come through fasting and prayer. So fasting was a tradition of Jesus, was a tradition of the prophets. So we have not invented anything new. Ramadan is nothing new. Ramadan is something that has been practiced by all the prophets, taking time to purify themselves, to free themselves from the needs of this world in order to draw nearness unto God. This is something that has always been practiced.
Now, this topic is one of the things that helped bring me to Islam. The issue of humbling and how Muslims pray. You see it all the time. Whenever they mention Muslims and talk about Islam, they will show Muslims in prayer. Most of the time going into the prostration. And everyone wonders why. Why do you have to bump your head on the floor? What is it necessary? I can't just talk to God. Why do I need to bump and bow my head on the floor? Is this something new? Let's see. Humbling while praying by bowing heads to the ground. We see in Genesis chapter 17, verse 3, Moses bowed his head. Abraham fell on his face. Jesus fell on his face and prayed in Matthew 26 and 39. This is nothing new. This is something Abraham, Moses, Jesus, all the prophets did. They prostrated their face on the ground in a semblance of su supreme submission to God. The lowest point you can reach on the earth is with your face on the ground. And in that position, you are praising God who is the most high. It is the most supreme form of worship. Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, said that a slave is closest to his Lord when he is in that position of prostration. Because he has lowered himself to the lowest position he can come to in this earth in order to praise the supreme creator who is the most high. We are not inventing anything new. This is one thing that I saw. I used to pray like this as a Christian. Even though I didn't know what I, I was doing a traditional Muslim prayer. And when I first encountered Muslims and saw them pray, this was one of the things that led me to see that they are not doing anything new. This is something that I've always read about in the Bible. Not bowing to statues and images. Not giving serenity, not giving worship, not giving adoration to any type of images. In, in Exodus, it says, Thou shalt not make any graven images. This is the second commandment. Number one, thou shalt have no other God before me. First commandment. Or no other God with me, or no other God beside me. And number two, you should not worship any graven images. Nothing that you create with your hands should you give adoration or worship to. Muslims, do not bow to statues, images, or anything except God. We do not give that which is reserved for God. We do not give any of the worship or adoration that is reserved to God alone to anything except God. Decoration of trees. This is a big thing during Christmas time. You go, you cut down the tree, you bring it in your house, and you decorate it. It is forbidden in the Bible, in Jeremiah, chapter 10, verses 2 through 5. It says, Cursed are those who venture into the wilderness and cut down a tree and bring it into their homes and decorate it with tinsel and silver. This was something that was practiced by the pagans. As coming at the winter time, everything would die. Everything was dying around them. All the leaves were falling off the trees. Everything was dying in nature except for this one tree. This one evergreen tree was staying alive. So they would imagine in themselves that it had some type of mystical power. It, it, it had some semblance towards life. It had some God within it that kept it alive. So for this reason, they would cut it down and bring it into their homes during the, the, the winter solstice, solstice or the shortest days of the year, which coincide with the day of December 22nd through the 25th. These were the shortest days of the year, so they would bring this tree into the home, decorate it, and give it worship. And now we, and I used to do as Christian, will do the same thing. We do not know where it comes from. Pagan worship, forbidden in the Bible. Muslims do not do this. Everlasting covenant. God made a covenant with Abraham and his descendants. This covenant was symbolized by circumcision. The males were circumcised at birth. This was a covenant made with God to Abraham and his progeny as a semblance to their surrenderance to him. Muslims still keep this covenant. We must, it is an obligation upon a Muslim to circumcise their sons at birth or at what is known as Akika or the eighth day of their, their life where they are given the circumcision and given their name. This is not something practiced in Christianity. Why? It's in the Bible. Why is it not practiced? You have to ask yourself that question. But we as Muslims are continuing in the tradition of the prophets. We are not inventing anything new. We are just following that which has always been there. Abraham's son Ishmael. The name for Ishmael was given to Abraham's son by God himself in Genesis 16 and 11. So those who tried to say and tried to disprove the, the, the prophethood of Muhammad, peace be upon him, by saying that Ishmael was an illegitimate son from Abraham because it was of his second wife, then ask them, let themselves ask them, you ask them, why did God name Ishmael himself? If he was not legitimate, if he was not given the covenant along with Isaac, and he was given the covenant, that Isaac would have a great uh, kingship and Ishmael would become a great nation. 
If this covenant was made with both and God named Ishmael himself, then how could he be illegitimate? I'm here to say that the Bible disproves that. Muslims respect Ishmael like Isaac as a son of Abraham. Wine drinking prohibited. This is something that is throughout the entire Bible. Throughout the entire Bible. In the Old Testament it is forbidden and in the New Testament it is forbidden in Luke 1 and 1 15. Drink neither wine nor strong drink. Drink neither wine nor strong drink. Muslims do not drink wine or alcohol ever. It is forbidden in Islam. This is nothing new. This is nothing new. It is something that Islam has always, always preached and is something that God has always taught. That wine and strong drink are forbidden. They bring about ills in society. And we know this even with this country. Know that it brings ills to society. They even prohibited it back in the 1920s. Alcohol was prohibited in this country, but people were bringing it in so illegally they decided, well, we need to get in on this money. So they made it legal so that they could profit off of it and tax it. But they know the ills of it. It has been forbidden by God all throughout time. Pork. Pork is forbidden in the Bible. God ordered Moses. And the swine is unclean to you in Leviticus 11.7. So why? If Jesus was a follower of Moses, if he came to redefine the law of Moses, he never commanded anyone to eat pork. Did he eat pork? No, he did not eat pork. Did he command anyone to eat pork? No. Did he give anyone permission to eat the pork? No. So why do you eat it? Why is it eaten? Jesus never ate pork in his life and Muslims are forbidden to eat pork or have any dealings with pork. Usury, interest. Interest is forbidden in the Bible. In the Bible, in Leviticus, one of the commandments given to Moses was take thou no usury. And then in Psalms 15 and 5, it says he has put not out his money to usury. Usury or interest, scandaling and, and, and scheming the people out of their wealth through deception, through high interest rate, through taking their money, loaning the money and taking back three and four amount the time, times the amount has been forbidden in the Bible and it is one of the ills that keeps society in the position where the rich stay rich, the poor stay poor. It makes a huge uh, separation in classes. And this is forbidden by God in the Bible and actually in the Islam there's an establishment called Zakat where everyone is supposed to give away, they have to give away a certain percentage of their money to the poor in order to put everyone at an equal standing. So this is why it was forbidden in the Bible and this is why Muslims still carry on this tradition and we do not allow usury. We do not allow interest. We do not take it, nor do we give interest. Disapproval of homosexuality. We know for sure the story of Sodom and Gomorrah in the Bible, where it says, the Lord reigned upon Sodom and Gomorrah. He overthrew those cities in Genesis. He overthrew and destroyed a city completely just for the practice of homosexuality. Now it is something that is rampant and something that is well ex accepted. You even have churches that are homosexual and lesbian churches. You have homosexual priests, homosexual pastors. Ask yourself, why? Why is this? Why can this be allowed? This is something that God has always said and this is something that is forbidden in Islam. Islam forbids homosexuality. We are just continuing on in the tradition of the prophets, in the traditions of what God has always said. No original sin. Here's the big one. The son shall not bear the iniquities of the father. Ezekiel 18 and 20. That verse goes on to say that no man can bear the sins or the burdens of another. Muslims believe that sin cannot be transferred or inherited from person to person. We cannot inherit the sins of our fathers. Our fathers could not inherit the sins of their fathers, nor can we inherit the sins of Adam. God forgave Adam just as he can forgive us. We are born pure without sin. This is something that has been taught throughout the Bible. There was no mention of original sin throughout the whole entire Bible. So if you take this away, if you take this concept of original sin away, then you take away the need for Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, to sacrifice himself on a cross for the forgiveness of our sins because it is only God who can forgive sins. No one can take on everyone else's sins and be punished for them. This would be injustice. And not only would God not give injustice to a single individual, but surely he would not do injustice to one of his prophets. Accountability. Every man shall receive his own reward to his own label. This is in 1 Corinthians 3 and 8. Every man is accountable for his own action before God. What he does, what he says, how he acts, he will be accountable for God himself. Muslims believe that every person is accountable for his or her deeds and they will be rewarded or punished accordingly to them.
This is the Islamic belief. Muslims are observing and maintaining. Not only are we observing, we are maintaining and preserving the instructions that are given in the Torah, in the New Testament, in the Bible. We preserve them and continue to practice them up until this day. Now let's get into the question about Muhammad. Peace be upon him. Muhammad, how much do you know about Muhammad? Is he in the Bible? Can the Bible verify his message? Let's find out. He is the last messenger of God to the day of judgment. And his prophethood is for the entire world. He was the only prophet sent to the entire world. Even Jesus himself was only sent to the Jews by his own mouth. When he was asked to preach into a Gentile, he said, why will I cast my pearls into swine? He was only sent to the Jews. This was his only mission. But Muhammad, peace be upon him, was sent to all the world. He is God's messenger. He is not God in any way. Therefore, Muslims do not worship him. We do not prefer to be referred to and we do not like to be called Muhammadans. Or, or we do not like Islam to be referred to as Muhammadism, which is what is put in some text, some uh, college texts, some dictionaries, some encyclopedias. You will see Islam referred to Muhammadism or Muhammadans. We are not Muhammadans. We are not worshippers of Muhammad. We are worshippers of the one true God who was taught to us how to worship him by Muhammad, who was only a man and a messenger of God. He received the first message from God through the angel Gabriel at the age of 40. He spent 10 years in Mecca and 13 years in Medina to preach Islam and he died as a regular human being at the age of 63 years old. During these 23 years, the Quran was revealed piece by piece, according to the time and necessity, for humanity. Muhammad was an ordinary person with a family and a children. He was the leader of a nation and a teacher. Now let's get into some of the prophecies. Is he in the Bible? Yes, he's in the Bible. Where is he in the Bible? I've never read that Muhammad is in the Bible. I'm going to show you. God willing, open your heart, open your mind, you will see. God blessed Abraham. Muhammad came from the progeny of Abraham through Ishmael, promised by God, where he promised by God that I will put one who will raise up, I will raise up one from your brethren, from your nation, from your brethren, who I will put my words into his mouth, and he will speak that which I reveal to him. And he will not say anything of his own accord, but only that which I reveal to him will he speak. And we know that this is how the Quran was revealed. The Quran was revealed by God directly to Muhammad in his mouth, and he quoted it for the people. It was never any of his own words mixed in. It was God revealed directly to him through him. And also in this verse, it says he will be like you. People refer this verse to Jesus. But if I had the time, I would break down to you that this could not be Jesus. Jesus and Muhammad, uh, Moses and Jesus have almost no similarities other than they being prophets of God to the Jews. But as far as them being, as Moses being the leader of a nation, as him having a family, having wives, having children, Things like this cannot be Jesus because he said he will be like you. The only person who this can refer to from the brethren who was given the word in his mouth is Muhammad who had these things. He was the leader of a nation. He did have a family. He did wives. He did have children. God did reveal things in his mouth. He spoke them directly to the people. This verse was revealing directly to him. Also, in Genesis, it says the rejected stone. Jesus spoke of the kingdom of God being taken away and given to the rejected stone who is referred to the rejected stone is referred to in Genesis 21, 13 through 18. The rejected stone is known as the nation of Ishmael. This is the rejected stone because no, the heathen would be rejected. His nation would be rejected by those who say that he is not legitimate. So this rejected stone is the nation of Ishmael or the nation of Muhammad, peace be upon him. The first revelation. This is one of the most interesting prophecies in the Bible about Muhammad. Read this, he said. I am not learned, replied. This is in Isaiah 29, 12. The story goes that the book was revealed unto one, saying, Read your book, I pray. The person replied, saying, I cannot read. Historical facts. Angel Gabriel delivered the first revelation of Quran. And this first revelation of the Quran was, Ikra bismi rabiko ladi khalaq. Read in the name of your Lord who created man. And then Muhammad replied to him, I am not learned. I cannot read. He replied in Arabic, Anna Makari, which means I am not learned, which are the exact words of the Bible. Then it is also said, which is a very interesting point, in the Bible, at the end of this verse, the next verse down, it says, the verse was revealed first to one saying, read your book, 
I pray. He said, I cannot, for it is sealed. The first person who was given the book said, I cannot open it because it is sealed. Now, and then it was given to the next one and he said, I cannot read it for I am not learned. We already stated that how this is a prophecy directly related to Prophet Muhammad. Now this book which is sealed is referred to again in Revelation. In Revelation it says that the book was brought, had seven seals, and it was said only the chosen one of God can open it. This book had seven seals, and only the chosen one can open it. Open the first page of the Quran, first chapter. The title of this chapter is Fatiha. Fatiha means that which opens something, that which releases or opens something. Count how many verses are in Surah Fatiha. Seven. Seven verses. Is this a coincidence? You ask you, yourself, the audience, have to ask that for yourself. To me, it's too big of a coincidence. The book was delivered to one saying, and it was delivered to Jesus. Or, I mean, no, excuse me, it was delivered to John the Baptist and asked him to open it. He said, I can't open it for a seal in Revelation. This was a direct prophecy that was prophesied in Isaiah. It was delivered to him saying, read it. He said, I can't for a seal with seven seals and only the chosen one of God can open it. Then it was delivered to Muhammad saying, read. And he said, I can't because I can't read. That was his direct answer. This is a direct prophecy in the Bible about Muhammad. Cannot refer to anyone else. Prophet from Arabia. Arabia, the prince of Qadr, is known in Ezekiel 27 and 21. Historical fact. Many converts migrated to Medina. Muhammad migrated in 622. The next year, a thousand Meccans marched against the Muslims. All the princes of Qadr. This is, Qadr was known as the area of Mecca. Mecca was known also as Qadr. A prophet like Moses. God said to Moses, I will raise up a prophet like unto thee, and I will put my words in his mouth, and he shall speak them all. We just referred to this, how this cannot refer to Jesus, but Muhammad, peace be upon him. Historical fact. Angel Gabriel used to bring these revelations from God to Muhammad, and he put these words in his mouth. He does not speak of his own desire, what says the Quran. The Quran, chapter 53, 53 3 and 4 says, He does not speak of his own desire. He only says that which is revealed to him which is exactly the same wording used in the Bible in this prophecy in Deuteronomy 18 and 18. Prophet gave laws. He will not fall or be discouraged till he establishes justice on the earth. Muhammad came with a complete code of laws. In spite of persecution and physical assaults, he was never discouraged nor expressed despair in his mission. Prophet with 10,000 saints. This is a very clear prophecy. He came with 10,000 saints. And on his right hand went a fiery law. This is in Deuteronomy 33, verse 2. Historical fact. Muhammad returned to Mecca after he was banished from Mecca to Medina. When he came back to overtake Mecca, he came back with 10,000 Muslims. And he established the rule of law there in Mecca, which is known as Sharia. Sharia means a prescribed law or a fiery law. He came with 10,000 saints to Mecca and established the law or the Sharia over Mecca. Until Silo comes. Jacob told his children, until Silo comes. Silo is in Genesis 49 verse 10. And Silo means peace in Hebrew. So it is, he, Jacob told his children, until peace comes. Until the peace comes. Which we know Islam is the peace. Pilgrimage of, Baca, of the Bacca Valley. They go through the valley of Bacca. There it has a place of springs, and early rain also covers it with pools. Psalm 84, 5 through 6. Mecca is referred to in the Quran as Bacca. In Surah 3, Ayah 96, it is referred to as Bacca in the Quran, Bacca in the Bible. The famous Zamzam spring is located there. The well of Zamzam that has been there since the time of Abraham. The most famous spring in the world is there in Mecca. Prophecy from the Bible. Also, Mecca gets flooded. Before they built the, the dams, in the, in the times of old, Mecca used to always get flooded in the springtime when the rains come. It would always flood. This is a direct prophecy in the Bible. Clear un and cut. Clear and simple and to the point. Cannot be put and, 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 and explained away in any other way. I challenge you. Explain it away in another way. It's very clear and very simple. Revealed little by little. He teaches knowledge line upon line. Here a little, there a little. Isaiah 28, 9 and 11. We know the Quran was revealed piece by piece. Here a little, there a little, depending on the need and the time. This is directly in the Bible. Prophecy by name. In the Hebrew text, Muhammad was quoted by name. Chikomen tahakim vetulum Muhammadim. This is in 
the Hebrew text, the name Muhammadim. And it is translated, his language is most sweet, and he is Muhammad. But it is translated in English as the praised one, or the one full of praise. Which we know Muhammad means he who is praised on this earth. Directly in the Hebrew text, Muhammad. And there is a tradition, or a saying of Prophet Muhammad, a story when some Jews came to him and asked him questions, and eventually they accepted Islam. One of the Jews said to him, that I have read your name in the Torah. I have seen your name for the past 25 years and have tried to erase it. And every day it would be there back. When I would wake up in the morning, it would be back. He was directly referring to this verse in the Old Testament. Prophet come to pass. When a prophet speaks, if his word does not come to pass or come true, the word which the Lord has not spoken. We know God informed Muhammad of many different prophecies. He, he, he directly prophesied the fall of the Romans that the Romans would be defeated, would defeat the Persians. This is in the Quran, the chapter uh, Romans, and the Quran was revealed during that time in support of the Christians. The Romans won the battle in 627. So a prophet has to be verified. The things he says has to be verified that they do come to pass. And we know the many prophecies of Prophet Muhammad have come to pass. Go read his prophecies for yourself. See if they have not come to pass. See if one is a lie. And I surely assure you that you will not find one. Muhammad predicted many future events. All of these things happen, for sure. There are some, I'm going to mention very quick, references about Muhammad also in Hindu scriptures. And some of the Hindu scriptures you read, that his name will be Muhammad, Muhammad Arab. O ye the pride of mankind, the dweller of Arabia. Also it says, Ahmed acquired religious law from his Lord. The law of religion is full of wisdom. He is not only in the Bible, but other religious texts. Muhammad is directly, directly referred to. We're not saying anything that has not been said to all of the nations, all of the people brought to them by their prophet. Muhammad is expressly stated many, many times. His name will be Muhammad. Jesus foretold Muhammad. He shall give you another comforter. This word comforter is known as a parcelet or a comforter. Muhammad is given the title in the Quran by God himself as Rahmatul Lil Alameen, meaning a mercy or a comfort to the world. He was given by God as a comfort to this world. And he was that comforter which Jesus himself spoke about. Jesus said, I have many things to say unto you, but you cannot bear them now. But he, when he comes, the spirit of truth, the spirit of truth comes, he will show you things to come. John 16, 14. The message of Jesus was incomplete. It was incomplete. If he was the last prophet, then why did he say, I have many things to say to you, but I can't tell you. My message is incomplete, but another one is going to come and complete my mission. And another prophet was needed. And this prophet was Muhammad who came, peace be upon him, 610 years after the death of Jesus. Or after the uh, so-called death. But as we as Muslims know that he did not die. He was removed from this world by God. During that time, 600 years later, was Muhammad, peace be upon him, came to this world. Gospel of Barnabas. Which we would have to get into it to some detail about the validity of the Gospel of Barnabas. It says Muhammad is his blessed name. In the Gospel of Barnabas, which we know Barnabas was a verified Disciple of Jesus Christ. He had a gospel just like Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Why was it not added to the Bible? You go read it for yourself and ask yourself that same question. All holy books lead to belief in Muhammad in the Quran. They all lead to the same thing. They are all leading in the same direction. They will all lead you to Islam if you look at them with an open mind and an open heart. The Quran. The Quran is the collection of all revealed messages from God to Muhammad. It is memorized by millions of people even today. Original copies of this Quran still exist, one in Tashkentin, one in Uzbekistan, and the other in Istanbul, Turkey. Sir William Muir, who was a well-known Orientalist writer, wrote, There is probably in the world no other book which has remained 14 centuries with so pure a text. No other book that has remained with such a pure text that is uncorrupted, unadulterated over the 14 centuries. 1400 centuries that it is, has been since it's revealed. Dr. Maurice Boussail, a French Christian physician, compared scientific facts of the Bible and the Quran. He found many scientific verses in the Quran. Each of them is correct. And he wrote, he wrote, a Christian physician, scientist wrote, I cannot find a single error in the Quran. This guy eventually became Muslim. He wrote a book called The, the, um, the Quran in Modern Science by Maurice Boussaia, where he went through these prophecies and these scientific facts in the Qur'an that were not known to anyone until the present day that were known by Muhammad, peace be upon him, that were revealed in the Qur'an. 
The Quran has many scientific facts unknown to man 1400 years ago. They were revealed in the Quran. Each of them is proven to be scientifically true. For instance, the Big Bang theory of creation of the universe, the planets and orbital patterns of the cosmos, the conception and stages of the embryological growth, the development of the human. These things revealed in the Bible. I mean, revealed in the Quran, excuse me, revealed in the Quran. Reference to fingerprints, how everyone has a unique fingerprint. This is not known until the 19th century. Revealed in the Quran 1400 years ago. How is it possible for an unlettered person? Muhammad could not read or write. He had no formal educational training. How is it that he, an ordinary human being, uneducated, knew these scientific mysteries 1400 years ago when no man on the earth had knowledge of them? You ask yourself that. Ask yourself, if he is not from God, how did he know these things? The Gospel of Barnabas, as I said, I'm going to spend a brief amount of time on it. The Gospel of Barnabas. Barnabas was a very close companion of Jesus. The Bible referred to him as an apostle in Acts 14 and 14. He was an apostle of Jesus. A good man, full of the Holy Spirit and of faith. In Acts 11, says he was a good man, full of the Holy Spirit and faith. In 325 AD, the followers of St. Paul gained control at the Council of Nicaea and made the following changes. It canonized the four Greek Gospels that are read today. It said that these only these four Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, these are the only ones that we can use. We're not going to use any of the other ones. All of the rest of them were ordered to be destroyed, including the Gospel of Barnabas. They said we're going to use these four because they agree with what we teach. They agree with what we believe. Everything else, we're going to throw it away. Even Luke himself in his own testament says that the reason why I wrote this testament the way I wrote it is because it's what seemed good to me. It's what seemed like would fit with the people with me. Not because I knew it would be true, but because I knew it would fit with the people. And these are the ones that uh, the, the followers of St. Paul at this council decided they were going to keep. The rest they did away with. Why? Ask yourself. The only gospel written in Aramaic. There was one gospel written in Aramaic, which they, they did discover pieces of it when they revealed the Dead Sea Scrolls that were just sayings of Jesus. They had nothing to do with the, the old, the, 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 Salvation of mankind through the death of Christ. They were only his sayings. The one, one, the one that was revealed in his language was also destroyed. Now, since I have clearly showed that Islam can be found in the Bible, what Muslims teach can be found in the Bible. We are not saying anything new. We have not revealed, Muhammad was not given anything new, peace be upon him. He was given that which was given to Adam, which was given to Moses, which was given to Noah, which was given to Abraham, which was given to Jesus, peace be upon them all, is exactly the same. So now, if what we have is exactly the same, if Islam is exactly the same, what is Islam? What is Islam? If it's the same thing been practiced by all the prophets, then what is it? If it's not what I'm practicing personally, then what is it? And this we must spend some time on. Since I've showed you how the verification can be proven in the Bible, let's find a little bit about what is this Islam. Islam has two meanings. A linguistic meaning. The linguistic meaning of Islam is surrender, purity, and peace. Basically that I gain peace through continual submission to the will of God alone. It also has an Islamic meaning. A meaning by, uh, given to it by Islam. If a person fully surrenders himself to Almighty God alone, worshipping Him purely, he will live in peace and harmony in this life and in the life hereafter. This was the message of Jesus, to surrender yourself, the greatest commandment. Surrender yourself to the Lord your God with all your might, with all your heart, with all your strength, and then love your neighbors as you love yourself. These are the greatest commandments. We're not saying anything new, we're quoting and repeating Muhammad's message, peace be upon him, that was given to all the prophets. Muslim means a person who submits himself to the will of God. That is it. A Muslim is someone who submits his entire self to the will of God. Islam is also based upon six beliefs. Six beliefs, five actions, or five pillars, or five actions. Six inward beliefs that are proven by five outward actions. These six beliefs are number one belief, belief in the Almighty God alone. That He is one, He has no partners, He does not share His dominionship with anyone, as the Bible says. That I am the Lord your God, and I am a jealous God, says God in Deuteronomy. I am a jealous God. I do not like for you to share my dominionship with anyone. In the Bible, Islam says the same thing. Muhammad, peace be upon him, taught the same thing. Second is that we believe in the angels. We believe in the angels of God, and we believe in all of them. 
Also, we believe in all the books. We believe in all the books of God. We believe in the Torah. We believe in the Bible in their original form, which we also believe that they are not now in their original form. They have been corrupted by mankind's hands and do not contain the original message. Pieces are still there, as I just showed you. We believe in all the messengers, all the prophets, from Adam to the time of Muhammad, peace be upon him. We believe in all the messengers. We believe in the day of resurrection, that everyone will have to stand before God on the day of judgment and give account for what he has done, and he will be rewarded or punished accordingly. And we also believe in the divine destiny. We also believe every human being is born pre-formatted to submit to God. This is something that is imprinted into our soul. Our soul created by God out of nothing has within it that small impression that we know who is God. We have that yearning in our soul that always will lead us towards God, whether we like it or not. For that reason, we cannot go to God on the day of judgment and say we did not know. Because for sure he's going to say, we know, you know, because I created your soul. I created your soul and I know it. No, human beings have a free will. We are able to choose between right and wrong. This is according to Islam. There is no compulsion in religion. I cannot force you to become Muslim. We cannot force Islam on anyone. Islam was not spread by the sword. Because then it would be illegal to do so. Islam was spread by the character and the teachings of Muhammad, peace be upon him, and the early Muslims. People are born without inherited sin. We do not inherit the sin of Adam. We are responsible, as I showed you, for our own actions. We cannot bear the sins and the burdens of another. There are no supremacy. All people stand as equals before God in their relation to Him. They're all equal. We all will be judged according to the same thing. We are judged only, we are only elevated in levels according to piety. Not according to race, tree, creed, tribe, language, nothing. Just by our piety before God. That's how we are raised and elevated in level. Belief in Allah. We must believe that there is no deity of worship except Allah. Worship is for Allah or God alone. Allah is the proper name for God. Arab Christian and Jews call the deity Allah as well. Fifteen times the word Allah is in the, the Christian Bible on the first page as we will see. Allah has many attributes and names which describe Him. We see here in the Bible, we see, we see the word. The first page of the Bible, we see Allah here. We see Allah here. We see Allah here. We see Allah here. This says, فِي خَلَقَ سَمَّوَاتِ وَالْأَرْضِ on the first day, Allah created the heavens and the earth. The first of the page of the Old Testament, Allah, 15 times on this page. We're not doing anything new. We're not saying anything new. This is just a name that is given a title and respect as a proper name for God. We believe Allah is unique. He has no partners. You cannot imagine Him in your head. You cannot picture Him on a wall. You cannot picture Him in your mind. He alone is the creator of everything that exists. No one helped him create anything. He did it alone without help. He does not have any progeny. He is not born from anyone, nor can anything be born from him. And there is nothing quite like him. He is neither male nor female. He has no gender, he has no race, he has no creed. His angels, we believe that they are created from light. They do not have a free will. They cannot disobey God. They carry specific tasks, such as carrying messages like the angel Gabriel. They protect human beings and they record our deeds. We each have an angel, two angels. One that record our good deeds, one that record our bad deeds. Everything we do, say or think is being recorded by these angels. This is the Islamic belief that is the same belief that has been passed on through the ages. His books, we believe in all of them. The scrolls of Abraham, the Torah, the, the Psalms of David, which is known as Az-Zabur, the Gospel, which is the, the New Testament, the Gospel of Jesus Christ in its original form, the Quran. Gabriel carried them to the messengers. In the original form, they were all 100% correct. The only one that exists now in its original form is Quran, revealed in its original language, Arabic. It's not been changed. In 1400 years, it has not been changed. It is the only one that can still be said to be a validified source of how I should live my life in front of God. What is the Quran? The Quran is the last revelation to humankind. It is the principal source of every Muslim's faith and practice. It deals with all subjects that concern human beings, including wisdom, doctrines, worship, and law. Its basic themes are that the relationship between God and His creatures, and between people and one another. The Quran provides guidelines for a just society, proper human conduct, and equitable economic principles. All of this in the Quran, how to live your life in every aspect, is in the Quran, and was exemplified by the life example of Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. 
his messengers. We believe that there was one message for all the messengers. They worship God alone and do not associate partners with him. This was a single unifying message of all the prophets. Worship God alone and do not associate partners with him. All messengers were the best human beings. <coughs> they do not commit major sins, as the Bible attributes to the prophets of being drunkards and murderers and thieves and scandal mongers. These are not our prophets. This is not how the prophets were. This is what men have put their hands to, to lower the prophets to their level so they could justify their own actions. They brought the prophets down because they could not reach their level. So they would bring them down, the people who had the right to change these things, so that they could justify their actions. How I could be any better than, than this person? Look, he was an adulterer, he was a killer. How you expect more from me? He was a prophet, I'm a human being. This was the reason for this justification. None of them are divine. They're all normal human beings chosen by God to deliver the message. Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, was a messenger just like all of the other messengers. Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, was not the founder of Islam. He did not found Islam. Prophet Muhammad is the last messenger of Allah. Islam was founded by God himself. His traditions, which are known as his sunnah, his ways are considered the second source of Islamic knowledge and legislation after the Quran. Before becoming a prophet, the Arabs used to call him the trustworthy and the truthful, Al-Amin. He was known as the trustworthy and the truthful. His message was well accepted by everyone until he started trying to call the people to the worship of one God from paganism. Then he became a liar. But he was always known as a truthful person. For Muslims, he is the most beloved person and the example to be followed. We follow Muhammad who was a follower of all of the prophets. Jesus was a follower of, of, of all the prophets. They all followed the same way which was revealed to them by God. We are following the last prophet Muhammad because his example, his message is still delivered to us in a clear way that has not been changed. Here is a sample of some of his traditions so you can see what the teachings of Muhammad were himself. Were they, were they harsh traditions that he pushed people to Islam? No, he said, none of you truly believes until he wishes for his brother what he wishes for himself. He who eats his field while his neighbor goes without food, he is not a believer. Powerful is not the one who knocks the other one down, but indeed the powerful one is who can control himself when he is angry. God does not judge you according to your bodies or appearance, but he scans your heart and looks at your deeds. The most harmful container a person may feel is his stomach. A few bites are enough for him, or else one third for his food, one third for his drink, and one third for his breath. These are some of the examples of the wisdom of Prophet Muhammad that was given to him by God alone. He was not a learned man. All of his knowledge, everything he learned, and the wisdom behind him not being learned was that everything he learned was directly from God alone. Could not be attributed to anyone else because his only source was God. Let's see what other people said about Muhammad, peace be upon him. Lamar Tain, a famous historian, a famous French historian in Turkey, who spoke French from Turkey, he said in his book, if greatness of purpose Smallness of means and outstanding results are the three criteria of human genius. Who could dare compare any great man in modern history with Muhammad, peace be upon him? No one dared to compare with him in the way that his example was, in the way his purpose was delivered and revealed. Bernard Shaw, a very well-known name in, in, in Western journalism and in Western um, book writing. He wrote in a book called The Genuine Islam. He was not Muslim, by the way. I believe that if a man like him were to assume the leadership of the modern world, he would succeed in solving its problems in a way that would bring to this world much needed peace and happiness. He also said that if he were in lead of the world today, were he to put, be put in charge of the world today, he would solve the world's problems while having an afternoon cup of tea. This is how simple it would be for him. Because why? Because his knowledge was revealed directly by God. He would be able to solve the world's problems with just his answers. And we know that the solution to the world's problems today is nothing else other than Islam. Islam will bring the world the peace that it is searching for. But people know this. This is the reason why Islam has been given a bad face. Because we want to avoid this from people. We don't want the people to know this, that Islam is what is going to bring you peace, not terror. We are the ones who bring peace to the world. Muhammad was a mercy unto mankind, not something to be afraid of. Also, Michael Hart, a famous Christian, he wrote in his book, ranking the 100 most influential people in history, he wrote, my choice, and he chose as a Christian, Muhammad, as number one. 
He chose Muhammad as number one. He said, my choice of Muhammad to lead the list of the world's most influential persons may surprise some readers and may be questioned by others. But he was the only man in history who was supremely successful on both the religious and secular levels. It is this unparalleled combination of secular and religious influence which I feel entitles Muhammad to be considered the most influential single figure in human history. Of humble origin, Muhammad founded and promulgated one of the world's greatest religions, and he became an immensely effective political leader. Today, 13 centuries after his death, his influence is still powerful and persuasive upon the people. The fifth pillar we have, or the fifth belief, is in the Day of Judgment. We believe that we will be resurrected after our death, we also believe that our book of deeds will be read in front of the people. Everything we've done will be exposed, other than that which God has concealed through His forgiveness. We will be accountable for everything that we have done. We will receive a fair judgment in front of God. We will be judged equitably and with justice in front of God. And then according to what we have done, we will be either given eternal paradise or we'll be sent to hellfire. Six, divine destiny. This means, in Arabic, it's known as Qadr. Qadr means that nothing happens without the knowledge of God. He sits outside of time. He does not see things as we see them through progression of time. He is the creator of time and he sits outside of it. He sees the beginning of time and the end of time all at the same time. All of that is encompassed by his knowledge. So he already knows what you're going to do. It's not as if he's going to make it. You do it. He does not make you do anything. You do it with your own free will, but he already knows. He already knows what choice you'll make. He already knows what choice you will not make. God knows what happened what is going to happen and what will happen and he knows the fourth. The fourth means that he knows what will not happen and if it happened, how it could happen. He knows what choices you will make, what you will not make and what choices that if you were to make them, how you would make them and how they would be enacted. This is how encompassing his knowledge is. He knows what will happen, what is happening, what will happen and he knows what would not happen. And if it did happen, he knows how it would happen. This is how great the knowledge of God is. Now, the five deeds or the five pillars. Number one is the inseparable testimony. And we're bringing this thing to a close, God willing. The inseparable testimony is La ilaha illallah Muhammad Rasulullah. There is no deity but Allah. There is no God but God, the one true God, Allah alone. And Muhammad is his messenger. This is the number one deed of Islam. That after you believe it in your heart, you must profess it, profess it with your mouth in order to be saved. Which this is in the Bible. That the, in the heart... You believe and the mouth is confessed unto salvation. This is in the book of Romans chapter 10. Same thing that Islam is saying. Establishing the prayer is the second deed of the second pillar of Islam. Establishing regular prayer for the remembrance of God. This was something that was known in the Bible. David used to pray three times a day facing Jerusalem. Jesus used to pray on a regular basis. Moses prayed on a regular basis. We're not doing anything new. This is in order to keep us in our remembrance of God. In the morning, afternoon, mid-afternoon, evening, night. You cannot forget about God. Well, God is giving us a, a, a method, a system to always have Him in our remembrance. To, as they say, pray without ceasing in the Bible. To always have Him in His remembrance. Three, paying the financial obligation which is known as zakah. You pay a certain percent of your savings to give. Four, fasting the month of Ramadan. And five, making the pilgrimage to Mecca. These are the five deeds of Islam. These are the five things which make someone a Muslim when he does these five things. And this is a little more detail. The testimony. The inseparable testimony. This is the key to enter into Islam. To say that there is no deity or worship except Allah. And that Muhammad is the messenger of Allah. Whoever says this with sincerity in his heart is to be considered a Muslim. This is how you enter into Islam. Whoever dies on this belief will enter paradise. Whoever dies on this belief will enter paradise if his sins are forgiven by God. This is the first key. Two, performing prayers. Performing the daily obligations of Salah. The five daily prayers. They must be prayed on time. There are certain times for the daily prayers. Morning, before the sunrise, afternoon, mid-afternoon, after the sunset, evening time. They can be performed on any pure spot in the earth. This was a blessing given to the, the nation of Muhammad and the Muslims, peace be upon him. This was given to the Muslims. Before the Jews, they had to go to temples. You cannot pray anywhere. You have to pray at the temple. Even in Jerusalem, to pray, you have to go to the western wall to pray. You have to pray at a certain spot. 
when Muhammad was given, peace be upon him, the blessing that the whole world is, is a place for prayer for you, as long as it's a pure spot on the earth. One discretion that you must pray towards Mecca. This is the one discretion that you must pray towards Mecca in order to give us a sense of unity. Even Jesus used to pray facing Jerusalem. David prayed facing Jerusalem. The Muslims, early Muslims, the first direction of prayer for Muslims was, was Jerusalem. Then it was turned to Mecca. And Mecca, a house, the Kaaba, built by Abraham himself. This house was built by Abraham and by his son Ishmael. So we are all, and it was the first house on this earth built for the worship of the one God. We're turning ourselves to that remembrance that we're worshiping the one God and a sense of unity. All biblical prophets like Ab Abraham, Moses, Aaron, and Jesus fell on their faces in their prayers. Islam is reviving the prophetic traditions that people have forgotten. We're reviving these traditions. We're bringing back into existence that which the people have forgotten. Three, the financial application or, or the zakat is 2.5% of any cash savings that are held yeah. over for one year. 5 to 10% of agricultural, 20% of any extracted resources and minerals. Anything that is pulled out of the ground, 20% is supposed to be given to the poor and the needy. The right, it is the right that the poor have upon the rich. It is the right that the poor have upon the rich to keep them from being so poor. It is what evens out the balance of society. So we do not have so many different classes of people. We do not have the poor staying poor and the rich staying rich. The poor feeding and, and, and off the rich's wealth. We have the, the, the wealth of the rich being given to the poor as their right. Zakah means growth and purification of your wealth. Fasting in Ramadan. During the month of Ramadan, during the daylight hours, we do not eat, drink, or have any sexual activities from dawn to sunset. It has been prescribed on other nations. All nations have fasted. It is a ritual of worship which enhances patience and perseverance through discipline. Nothing. Jesus fasted as I showed you before. All the prophets fasted. Now, and of course, fifth is the, the, the Hajj or the pilgrimage one must make to Mecca if he has the op opportunity to do so. He goes to Mecca, he endures the trip to meet and have an annual gathering of Muslims to sh show their unity, to show their solidity, to worship God in, in the first house ever been worshipped for God. This is something that, that all nations made pilgrimage to one place or another. Now let's discuss a, in breaking down the last three very important issues that I would like to discuss, which are contemporary issues. Hijab or the covering for women, the status of women in Islam, and jihad. Let's look at this picture here. We have a picture here. We have three women. We have Mary, the mother of Jesus, in a Christian church. We have a Christian nun, and then we have a Muslim woman. Do we see any, any, any similarities here? Covered, covered, covered. You cannot tell the difference between these three women. We're not doing, she's not doing anything different then this woman is doing, following the example of this, who is Mary, the mother of Jesus, peace be upon her. Nothing new here. This is a verse from the Quran telling about the reason why women cover. But this verse was not revealed just to the women. It was first given to the men. The men also have a hijab. They also have a, a means of modesty. And say to the believing men that they should lower their gaze and guard their modesty. And that is pure for them. And Allah is aware of what they do. Then it says... And say to the believing women that they should lower their gaze and guard their modesty and that they should not display their beauty except that which is apparent, their face and hands. And to draw their veils or the hijab over all of their bosoms and not to reveal their beauty except to their husbands, their fathers, <coughs> their husbands' fathers, their sons, their husbands' sons, their brothers or their brothers' sons or their sisters' sons. All of the relatives that are they, they cannot marry. They can show these things to them. But this is not for to be shown to the world. This is not something to broadcast to the world. This is something that is a, a beauty that she alone owns. And she only can dis display that beauty to someone who is able to have it. Not just to broadcast it to the world. We, we treasure women in Islam. We don't just throw them to the world. We protect them. If you had a, a, a huge diamond, would you walk around with it in your hand, leave it on top of your car, set it outside on the street? Would you, would you do that? No, you wouldn't. You would want to keep it and guard it because it is something precious. This is what we, the, the status that Islam gives to women, that they are something precious, they are something to be protected, they are something to be cherished, something that is not just for everyone, it is only for those who are allowed to have them. And the same for men. I don't walk in the streets showing all of, exposing everything. I don't walk in the streets exposing my, my, my private parts in my areas. I, exp I, I hide this. I keep this only for someone who is allowed to have it, which is my wife. Status of women. Women in Islam like men have the right to gain an education. They have the right to be educated. 
They have the right to engage in business. And when they engage in business, their profits are theirs alone. We don't, even as men, don't have any right to them. They don't have to give it to their husband. They can keep it. They have the right to engage in professions that keep them in line with the Islamic traditions. Something that does not take them out of their Islamic way of life. They have the right to engage in public life. They have the right to keep their family name and identity. When a sister comes into, uh, to his, uh, our sister gets married, she does not have to take the, the name of her husband. She keeps her own name, her own identity. She is who she is and keeps that identity. And her possessions, everything she owns is hers. That her husband does not have a right to take any of it. If any society, and I want this to be very clear, if any society or individual oppresses women, discriminates against them, it is against Islam and not because of it. It is not because of Islam. If a man or a society or a nation oppresses women unjustly, it is against Islam, not because of the teachings of Islam, and it is because of their own shortcomings. Please do not associate this with Islam. The last topic, jihad. This is the big one. Jihad. What is jihad? You hear jihad used many different ways. Jihad, Islamic fundamentalist, terrorism, this, that, and the other. What is, what is jihad? Jihad has a linguistic meaning also, just like Islam. The linguistic meaning means to strive or struggle. To struggle to do something. In Arabic, if they build a huge building, it will be said to them, uh, they made a jihud on this building. Jihud coming from the word jihad, meaning they struggle. They, they struggle to make this building. It also has an Islamic meaning. Number one Islamic meaning, it is that it is a, a non-violent struggle within oneself for a life of peace. This is the number one meaning Islam gives to jihad. A non-violent struggle within oneself for a life of virtue. And also it has a meaning to fight to establish justice, which is the supreme goal. Fight to establish justice and eradicate evil on the earth. Jihad orders in the tradition of Prophet Muhammad. Here's some of the rules and regulations that Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, put down as rules for jihad. You are never to kill innocent people. Never, for no circumstance whatsoever, can you kill innocent people. The Quran says if you kill one innocent person, it is as if you have slaughtered all of humanity. And if you save one innocent person, it's the same as you have saved all of humanity. Never injure prisoners of war. Do not beat them. Do not capture them and then kill them and cut their heads off. This is against Islam. Never kill animals. Never destroy crops. Never destroy infrastructures. You're not to destroy their whales. You're not to destroy their, their means of communications. As we see, is, is not the same rules that are used against Muslims. You're not to destroy their infrastructures. You're only to fight those who fight you. You never mutilate the bodies of the enemies, dead or alive. All prisoners of war are given a fair treatment. Even in the times of Muhammad, peace be upon him, prisoners of war were told, if you can teach 10 Muslim children to read, you can go free. You can go free. This was the virtue of Islam. Women and children are protected from harm. You cannot touch women, you cannot touch children. Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, during one of the wars that Islam fought, he saw a dead woman laying in the road, and he was very upset about this. And he questioned the people around him. Why is this woman dead and she was not involved in the battle? This is against Islam. Always bury the dead with respect. They would always bury the dead, even if they were non-Muslim, with respect. Put them in the ground, give them proper burial, treat them with respect. Note, this is 1400 years, these rules, these regulations, 1400 years before the Geneva Convention. 1400 years before Geneva Convention, Islam had these laws. This is not something new. Same thing. Muslims are neither allowed to accept slavery or occupation. We're not allowed to be subjugated. We're not allowed to sit by and allow people to put us into slavery, to occupy us and allow and oppress us against our religion. This is something we do not accept. We are ordered to fight against this, to try to establish justice on the earth. Islam advocates moderation in this aspect. To take whatever means, if they can be done diplomatically, do them diplomatically. You first want to try to change it in the most wise manner. Islam abhors extremism. We do not like extremism. Extremism to one side or the other. We are moderate. We are in the middle. What God has chosen for us. A middle nation. A middle nation. Islam abhors terrorism. The word Islamic terrorists, Islamic fundamentalists, Islamic extremists. These words are an oxymoron. They cannot fit together. Islam and terrorism do not fit in the same sentence because Islam is against terrorism, terrorism is against Islam. The word war on terrorism is an oxymoron. You cannot fight a war on terrorism because war itself means the killing of innocent people. The killing of innocent people is terrorism in its definition. So war on terrorism is an oxymoron, it cannot happen. You cannot fight a war on terrorism because terrorism is war. Oppression, oppression is abhorred by Islam. We are not allowed to be the oppressor or be oppressed. 
Prophet Muhammad peace be upon him said to help your brother if he's an oppressor or if he's oppressed. They said we know how to help him if he's oppressed, but how can we help him if he's an oppressor? He said stop him from oppressing. So I finish with this. God willing, you reconcile the proofs with yourself that I have given you. Reconcile them with your own hearts and arrive at the same conclusions that I have arrived at. That the true original message of the Bible and of Jesus Christ himself and of Adam, Moses, Noah, Jesus, Muhammad is all the same. That the God, and they're all, their message was that the oneness of God in the truest sense. Their message was the same. That God is one in the truest sense of the word and that they all submitted themselves to God as Muslims. Meaning one who submits himself to the will of God. Inshallah, God willing, through this information, you arrive at these same conclusions that I arrive at because it is for the safety of your soul. It is for the salvation of your own soul. The only way to make it to paradise is to accept God, Allah, as one, alone, and accept all of the prophets, including Muhammad, the last one. This is our message of Islam that is in the Bible, in the Torah, in the New Testament. We are not doing anything new except reviving the traditions of the prophets of old. So may God guide you. Ask for His guidance. Go back. Look with an open heart at the evidences. Ask God to guide you. And God willing, you will arrive at the same conclusions I have arrived at. Thank you for your time. And I hope that I have been of some benefit. Thank you for watching The Dean Show. Assalamu alaikum. Peace be unto you.